Lord, this morning as we go through your word, Philippians, Holy Spirit, would you just make application in the appropriate places for each of us as individuals and all of us as a body that's been called out by your name, Ashford Community Church. Lord, we're grateful for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet, a light to our path. It allows us to have an illuminated life. And, and Father, we're just grateful, just very grateful for your watch care over our lives, for your long suffering with us, for your tender mercy, for your willingness, God, to bridge the gap, to make the rescue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. You may be seated. So appreciative of our team and our senior associate, Pastor Kenneth, um, and grateful for you guys being here today. Yeah. We have been for four weeks thus far in the book of Philippians. We're in the first chapter. Uh, this morning, we're going to get through most of the text, and the reason we're not going to go all the way to the end is because the last few verses are actually the setup for chapter 2, and I can't wait to get to chapter 2, but let me say it won't be next week, um, because next week, we're having something brand new that we're introducing into the church life. And we're calling it Saturation Sundays. Yeah. And Saturation Sunday is for the absolute express purpose of us just laying things aside and pressing into the fullness of God's Spirit in such a way that we're really specifically believing Him for, for miracles, for signs, for wonders, for the anointing of God to come. And we feel like doing a double service on a Sunday will help give us that extra inoculation that we need to press into that. How many understand that sometimes it's about the press? <laughs> we, we press on to the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Well, it's interesting that term is used that we press on into it, that we have to, we have to move into it, that there may be some resistance how many know a lot of us in Western culture, we have all kinds of things to distract us. We have all kinds of things to build this uh, resistance for us. But I, I want us to press past all of that and experience this uh, Saturation Sunday. And uh, I've got some good friends of mine that are revivalists. They're going to inaugurate this for us. They'll be here next Sunday, Jeff Collins and, and, and David Hunter. David Hunter, Ken will know him, a few others will. He was a worship leader that I had back 30-some-odd years ago that was born in revival in the early 90s. And uh, he, I guess he was first a staff person with me when he was like 22, 23 years old. And um, he's coming up from Harlingen to be with us next Sunday. And Jeff, uh, my, my good friend Jeff Collins, powerful, powerful man of God. I would call him very much like a Jeremiah. He's a weeping prophet, but he's a happy weeper. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? I mean, he's full of the joy of the Lord, and, and the joy of the Lord is his strength, but yet he, he weeps a lot. But man, does he have some incredible testimonies that will just engage you and just lift your spirit up. You want to have your friends and family come and, and be a part and uh, so I think we have a little clip. Do we, do we have a clip that we can throw up? No, we don't. Oh, that's a shame. Well, it's on, it's on our website, I believe. I hope it is. Or it's, uh, maybe it's on Facebook or here or there somewhere. And it shows these guys and some of their ministry activity. Well, everybody say it. Saturation. Saturation. Uh, let's wait a minute. 
Say it this way. I, I want to take you on a journey. I'm in preparation for saturation so I can move into a new transformation. I like that. I, I, I thought somebody had helped me with it. Let's try it again. So I'm in preparation for saturation that will lead me to transformation that will ultimately result in celebration. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, so we'll just, we'll, pre we'll press into that place, and so we encourage you to be with us next week. It'll be a good, good time uh, in the Lord. All right, let's get into the text. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me let me stop right there. You need to know what happened. If you hadn't been with us before, let me catch you up. Paul is writing from prison. Perhaps he's in, the Ephes, uh, in Ephesus in jail. And in fact, most commentaries would say he's probably in, in uh, the Puritan, in the imperial, imperial guard area there in Ephesus. And he's, he's in that situation. He's already birthed the church in Philippi, which we've already studied about. I, I strongly encourage you to catch up and, and check out these messages before because you'll understand exactly where we are in the text. I can't go back and review. It takes too much time. But I'll just say this. He's writing from prison. And so this new church that he began in Philippi, Acts 16 gives you a whole underview of how uh, the Philippian house church began into a church. And he's writing them because they did some great things, as Don shared this morning, in supporting Paul. And now, all of a sudden, they find out Paul's in jail. Oh, my. What's going to happen? How can this be? Some might even be questioning, well, if he's a man of God, what's he doing in jail? Hello? How many of you ever had questions like that? I mean, if this guy really was serving God, why would this be happening to him? Don't look at me like you never th had that thought. Everybody in this room's had that thought at some time or another, right? Well, that, this new church, that's where they're there. I mean, they're wondering what, what, what's going on. So Paul's writing them. He's commending them, as Don spoke to, about their incredible gift and offering and support. But he also knows there's some unrest. And so he's just, in fact, this is one of the most personal uh, letters where Paul is addressing his person. Most of his epistles are doctrinal, and they don't say a whole lot about him personally. But in this particular one, he, he expounds on his dilemma, and he's sharing with it. So everybody good? We're called up. Paul's in prison. Here we go. It's kind of funny, i got to say this just before I hit, that the Philippian house church was actually begun with Paul having a break out of prison when you read over there and here he is he's in prison again it's just an interesting comment to me in my thoughts so I want you to know the things that happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel in other words I'm in distress I'm in what appears to be a bad circumstance but because of the predisposition of my heart in my purpose I want you to see I don't view it the way the world views it. Hello? Everything that's going on right now in the world, I hope you got a different perspective than what you're hearing from CNN and Fox News and everywhere else. I hope your perspective is an eternal perspective instead of a temporal one. Can somebody say yes? yes? How many know that we were born into eternal life and eternal life, Zoe life, began whenever we said yes to Jesus and we came under a new kingship, we came under a new lordship in a new narrative. We perceive things, we look at things from an entirely different perspective or so we should. And it's a sign if we are caught up in all of the quandary that the world gets caught up in that we are not looking at the right thing. Because my Bible says whosoever has Jesus in view will have perfected peace. Will have perfect peace because they will see it in light of eternity's perspective instead of the temporal perspective. 
I, I really need you to see this because here in Philippians, this is what Paul is wrestling with. He's taking this new church and he's saying, look, I don't want you guys caught up in all of the fanfare and all of the scoop that's being spoken about me. The word on the street. I want you to look at it in concept. I want you to look at it in the context of eternity and what my calling is. Because you see, your calling will take you through circumstances that the narrative won't. So look at this. So <laughs> it turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard. And to all the rest, that my, my chains are in Christ. D do you know what he's saying? You know what that's code for? It's code for, hey guys, I got put in prison, but guess what? I've got an inside track into the empirical guard because they're seeing me live out my Christianity in front of them in such a way that they're being impacted by the gospel. That those these circumstances are all crazy and nuts, they're being impacted by the gospel. Most of you know my experience uh, when I was imprisoned in, in India uh, a number of years ago. Ken would definitely remember it because he was a member of my church when the rumors were they beheaded him. <laughs> I still got a head. I'm still here. But the rumor went out. But I tell you what, I learned that through praise and power, God has a way of turning things around for his purpose. So you just need to understand something right now. Whatever you're going through in life, if you have eternity in view, and if you have your calling in check, and you've made your calling and election sure, I tell you what, you're going to get through. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> and most of the brethren... And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains and were much more bold to speak the word without fear. And I want to stop there. What he's saying here, he's saying this. He's saying, look, my boldness in my situation is not only for me and for the palace guard, but it's also for the body of Christ that's represented there in Ephesus, we believe, and they're also getting bold in their faith. You remember that little saying, and I'll look at some scriptures a little later on, how many times Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation, unto rescue. Everybody say it, unto Unto, he's not, see, Paul lived in a shame, honor culture. There's three different primary cultural dimensions within the world. And there in the Middle Eastern area, in the, it, 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 is, it is a shame, honor culture. And it's a big thing. It's a big thing to be shamed. You don't want that. You want to be in your best light. You want to look the best and so on and so forth. You don't want to be caught in that shame. You've, you've heard about these, some of these extreme things that people do out of shame when, they, when somebody leaves their faith or the religion in, in some of our areas. They'll even kill or have a mercy killing in the sense because they have brought shame upon the family. So the pressure is heavy, but Paul is saying, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It might be bringing all kinds of turmoil and stuff around, but I'm, I am, if you will, I am honored to carry this gospel. Are we honored to carry the gospel? Are we honored to be called by the name of Jesus? Is our life showing that we're honored? No, I mean, people are reading your pages. What are they reading? You are an epistle known and read of all men. What are they reading? Are they seeing the honor and the glory of God upon our lives? Are we over here wringing our hands with the rest of the world about all the dilemma that's going on? I, I, I've got to keep saying this because, friends, God has given us a rest that he prepared for us before the foundation of the world that we should enter in according to Romans 4. Excuse me, Hebrews 4. And if, it, and if we miss that rest, 
wow, we make, our, we make our journey here on this side very difficult, but stay with me. So here we go. They were common to my change much more to speak the word without fear. I love this. For some indeed, and then he gets into an interesting subject. For some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. Now, let me stop there for again for a moment. By the way, the, the way I'm preaching this morning, don't always preach this way or teach this way. It's kind of a running commentary. We're going verse by verse, text by text, and I'm giving commentary to the verse and kind of uh, and b- building on it a bit and giving you some understanding from some of the Greek. But, but what, it, what is happening right here is kind of an interesting thing. Paul is here in prison, and weirdly enough, there could be people that are also believers that are using his distress to their advantage to try and build their ministry. Are you listening to me? Again, I had this firsthand. The evangelist that took me to India while I'm in prison four of them, by the way, while I'm in prison, he, he hops on a jet, comes back to America, and uses it at a fundraising opportunity, taking the distress and utilizing it. Hello? I know you got very quiet in here. You understand, you understand that unfortunately there are many people in the cause of Christ that use it as a business and a competition as opposed to a completion of one another and a building up of the body of Christ. They misuse and misappropriate the love of God and the power of God that we're supposed to have. This, I think I'm making it plain. That's the problem. <laughs> It's a problem for some, anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. L- l- look, w- look with me. I, I, and, and you know what else it could be? It could also be, that, that, that's one set of commentary, but it also could be like a tongue-in-cheek thing to where people are using, you, you remember what uh, Pilate did whenever, uh, whenever Jesus got put on display on the cross? He, what did he do? He, he got up there and he commanded there to be inscription written and placed over the crucifix. And it said, here, here lies the king of the Jews. So did he mean it that way? But it was still the truth. It was still the truth. He was the king of the Jews, but not only the king of the Jews, but the king of the whole world. In fact, that's really what the issue right now is. Who's, who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the king of glory? Or are you going to serve the God of this world? It really comes down to that. Uh, way back, Bob Dylan, back many, many years ago, he, he did three Christian albums during the time that he got born again. And one of his famous songs from that is, You've Got to Serve Somebody. You've Got to Serve Somebody. And I want you to know whether you recognize it or not, you are serving somebody. The Bible says very clearly, there is a, you know, you're either with me or you're against me. It's a very pretty clear message for us. You're either in the light or you're in the darkness. We're children of light, according to the word. So, The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains. But look at verse 17. But the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Everybody say gospel. See, the gospel message, the good news of Christ, that Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, is is not mad at anybody. He wants to save everybody. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everyone to be rescued. He wants all to come into the kingdom of God. All of those things, that's the good news. That should be the news that we are bearing because we are Christ's bearers. 
We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency might be of God and not of us. And that treasure that we have is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. You're carrying hope. Look at your neighbor right now and say, I got some hope for you. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you do. You got some hope for them. We're, we're, the, we're the light of the world, the Bible says. We, we are the hope carriers. But look at this. Look at this. If the enemy can shame you, can shut your mouth, can cause your life to be lived in isolation, the hope that is in you does not get displayed. It does not get received from the world. Those that need it. So Paul is, is in this situation, and look, look how he says. He says, what then? So he's posing this question out there. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense, look at that, or in truth, Christ is preached. So he's saying, even if they are mocking me, even if it is a message like piled through on top of, of Jesus' cross, it doesn't matter. Christ is being elevated. Christ is being preached. Christ is being lifted up. And, and this, is a, this is a powerful thing. And let me just say this. We, as a people, we need, to, we need to just be concerned about what it is God has spoken to us to do and be about that business. Whatever it is God has for us as a body, whatever he has for us as an individual, be about that business and giving ourselves into that and not be overly concerned about what others are doing. We've got enough issue just dealing with our own stuff than to be concerned about everyone else. Let's just have the attitude that Paul had, which I would consider to be a pretty, uh, you know, inclusion airy kind of an idea. Hey, man, Christ is being preached. I'm just going to bless and say hallelujah, glory to God, and I'm going to take care and do what it is I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not going to get caught up in strife and doubt and unbelief and backbiting and gossiping and and having all kinds of judgment and all that kind of mess no nope, that's not going to be the measure of my life I've got better and more important things to do and that's to share the good news in every way and whether they do it in pretense or in truth Christ is preached and in this I rejoice yes I will rejoice can we have that attitude okay so I've, I'm going to have to speed along here to get as far as I wanted to get and get you out in not too long from now. So we all help me? Okay. Hyperdrive. <laughs> Hyperdrive. Here we go. Ready? For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and for the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I love that, the way that has this cooperation. Paul is saying, look, it's your prayers and it's the Spirit of God that's going to get me out of this situation because I believe God wants to get me out. According to my earnest expectations and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so also in Christ I will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, I want you to understand, Paul's not just having a case of rah, rah idea here. He, he is considering this. This isn't just a philosophical statement. He's sitting in the prison. And they could execute him. And later they do. In another instant. But at this particular time, he's wrestling with this. And he's wrestling with the life and the death question. But his life and death question has this foundation. It has this anchor in it, which has to do with the gospel of Christ. And because it has that anchor, his perspective is totally different. Listen to his perspective. According to my earnest expectation, verse 21 says, For to me, famous scripture, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then he goes to explain his, I guess you would say his philosophy of life, if you will, which is his way of living, his perception of life. I like to call it the Jesus way of life, but we'll get into more of that here in just a moment. Look, look, look at this. He says, 
if I'm to live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. In other words, he's pressed. For I am hard pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Wow. Those of you that were with us a couple of weeks ago, remember when he was in the prison in Philippi and the chains came off and the prison doors were open and the earthquake happened, but he chose not to leave the prison nor anyone else left because he was there for the prisoner guard to get rescued. Do you remember that? He didn't use his freedom for himself. And I had you all recite the, the statement, my breakthrough's not just for me. Your breakthrough is for others. If you have the gospel perspective. If we don't have the gospel perspective, we'll get caught up in the world's illusion that me, mine, and mine are what count. Oh, it's going quiet again. Well, let me keep going. So what he says here, he says, I'm hard-pressed between the two having the desire to part Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh more needful for you, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for all of your progress and joy of faith. In other words, he's projecting his faith. He's saying, look, I don't think I'm finished here yet. I think there's still more work, more fruit for me to do with the gospel than it is for me to go be with Christ, which would be a whole lot better. How many of you ever said, oh, Jesus, take me out of here? I mean, it's not Jesus, take the wheel. It's Jesus, come get me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, sometimes we, we get into that situation, but that's, that's, not, that's not Paul's perspective because he realizes, wait a minute, I'm here for purpose. And my purpose is to live out the destiny that God has created for me. And that destiny is to share the good news of Jesus with everyone I possibly can to as rescue many people out of hell as possible and present them before the throne of glory. Amen? I'm going to leave it there for a moment. We'll come back another day. But look at this. I love this. Verse 28. Actually, I'll go back and pick uh, 25 and 26, excuse me. And being confident of this, I know I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Final comments this morning. We must look at all of situations in life from a different light, a different perspective. Because it's Jesus who is in us, as us, for others in this world. He's living his life through us. If we're truly his children, our life is not our own. Look at your neighbor and say, it don't belong to me. <laughs> don't, I don't belong to me. I belong to him, right? My life is not my own. So if I have that in mind, then we have to have the Jesus factor as the motivating dimension of our life, the Jesus way. I know there was a popular thing a number of years ago, what would Jesus do? And everybody put it on their braces and everything became a really cute thing. You know, everybody, what would Jesus do? But can I put it to you this way? Jesus has told you what he would do. And he's living his life through you. The question is, are you yielding to the Jesus way? Or do you like your way better? You know, it's not a Burger King commercial. Have it your way. Have it your way. <laughs> it's not having your way. It's having his way. He's King Jesus. Right? That's why the God of this world, the Bible says, who's the devil, wants to shut us down, shut us up marginalize us, make us not relative, all those kinds of things. But I want you to know I serve a king. Now look at this. 
this is it's for these reason i i suffer these things second timothy 1 12 says nevertheless i'm not ashamed for i know in whom i believed and i am persuaded that he's able to keep all that i've committed to him and then there's that saying again against that day the day of jesus's return we spent a lot of time on that in earlier sessions guys let's pray Lord, I truly believe it is our desire to allow uh, your heart and spirit to live through us in such a way, God, that it allows others to see that our communion with you is the very thing that can also set them free. Lord, you know better than I do that not crazy enough to know that we don't have struggles and that we don't have things that try to distract or things that try to, in a sense, sabotage our relationship with you and with others. But Lord, we want to present those things afresh to you, anew to you, and say, God, would you show us the Jesus way? That there can be that compelling reality in us that, that moves us into those places, Father, of of absolute of absolute breakthrough so that others can also come through to life Lord I'm asking you today that upon your people that are here have heard this word Lord that it would be hidden in their heart and that there might be the opportunity Father for the shaping of the truth of the gospel God to come and bring that transformative dimension to their life in such a way that they um, they will find a place of peace a place of rest a place of assurance in you and a place of victory for it was for Christ that we were made free it was for freedom that we were set free we're now to be free indeed to live unto you. In Jesus' name, we give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise. You are worthy. Can everybody say that once again? Worthy. Worthy.